we go full speed and force ahead and launch into another fascinating afternoon discussion uh, led by my dear friend John Palfrey. The next hour is about bringing it back together, what we discussed this morning, uh, try really to understand is there common ground uh, among the three perspectives, three tracks we uh, discussed this morning. And Katerina helpfully reminded us, of course, that there is significant overlap among the three perspectives. So this session um, tries to uh, bring these three perspectives back together um, to identify key factors and also get as concrete as possible and identify intervention points. And uh, I'm really grateful that you're moderating this session. It's no easy task thank and you, you're Wirth. the best. No, so that's not true. Thanks. Over to you, John. Wirth, thank you so much and thank you uh, everyone for the great food for thought we've had so far. Um, so I think you know this, but the design of the program over these three days it features two moments where we consolidate our gains. One is sort of a top-down consolidation of gains, which is this one, and then a second synth synthesis session, which is a little bit more the bottom-up, out of the cluster sessions, um, what have we been discussing in a more distributed fashion. And we've structured it along two lines, at least for this um, sort of midpoint check-in. One on the left here are key factors um, for success in OER. And then on the right, um, somewhat more detailed uh, potential intervention points, things that people are excited about doing moving forward to accomplish a vision that I think we're all still um, trying to parse out. Um, the wonderful Berkman staff, and thank you for this, have been listening through the session so far and have um, started to parse things into these categories. But what we're about to do is a total unconference uh, session. We will um, uh, just be discussing as a group where we think uh, we should uh, populate field 7 uh, to N on the left-hand side and field 16 and down, or you can edit um, the ones if you feel like you've been uh, misheard here on the right. But I thought just briefly before um, going to these and allowing you in the background to take a look at what we've got on the Google Doc, I suspect we could even share with you the link somehow to the Google Doc and you could write um, directly into it. Um, I don't know, do we want to create you guys a tiny URL or something that we could, Berkman crew, could we create a tiny URL slash something and then share it? Yeah. Um, so if other people want to use those computers that you have here, um, I'll let you look at these for a moment. I want to just um, describe two projects that uh, relate to the Harvard Law School and might situate this session in the actual building that we're in right now. Uh, story number one had to do with the renovation of some old classrooms on this campus. Um, and this is a building uh, just, we walked by it on the way to the um, dinner last night in Loeb House. It's the very long, grand building called Langdell Hall, um, which has the big library and it has classrooms situated on, on either end. And uh, in the late 1990s, during the dot-com boom, um, I was a student at the time, several others in the room were students, but I was not, not on the faculty. But the faculty had a discussion and um, decided to renovate the big classrooms on either end. And the idea was to wire them and to make them much more comfortable. So in the old Harvard Law School tradition, they had very um, hard plastic chairs. They were quite uncomfortable, and you couldn't even swivel them, and they had a stick to the bottom. So you kind of had to sit there and be grilled, Socratic style. And that worked with the teaching mode that we had. But in front of all the students, um, more comfortable chairs were created. But um, in front of all the students uh, were put two things that looked kind of like an ashtray that you flip up. Um, one was power, and the other was an Ethernet jack. And what happened after completing this renovation, a million dollars per classroom, um, was that they looked beautiful and they were much more comfortable and students could roll around instead of sitting like this while they were being taught. Um, but the faculty immediately took a vote to turn off the Ethernet jacks as soon as they had been put in. Why? It just seemed like a terrible thing to let the internet in the classroom. Why did we spend all this money to wire this up? Um, one faculty member, our friend Jonathan Zittrin, said, oh, in the past they were doing solitaire, now they can do hearts, right, if they're um, networked. Um, but this basic idea that in institutions we often say, yes, we need the technology, it's going to improve education, let's put some in. And then once you have it, they're like, oh gosh, what did we do? We want to turn it off immediately. Um, a similar project is the building that we're in now to situate you. This building actually opened only a few months ago, and uh, it reflects in many respects what the Harvard Law School seeks to be in education. There are wonderful aspects of it. It was designed beautifully by the um, then Dean Elena Kagan, now Justice Kagan, which I love to say, our Supreme Court Justice, um, by bringing teachers in with architects and others and said, what kind of an educational environment do we want to create? And some aspects of this have gone very, very well. So a third of this building, the um, segment this way, um, is all the clinical wing. 
So now every year, most Harvard Law School students do real lawyering by practicing in communities, and it's a crucial part of the educational mission, and we've honored it with a third of this huge, beautiful um, building. It's a very important part of the experiential learning of being a lawyer. Um, other respects, if you tour through some of the rooms, you'll see lots and lots of rooms where there are sort of small uh, clusters and tables so that students can now work in teams. So instead of just drilling them as we did individually, we now actually have them work in teams to solve problems. Another thing very hard to do in classrooms that um, were structured the way others were. There are breakout rooms everywhere which are filled with students. It's actually hard as a teacher here sometimes to get breakout rooms to have students in because they work um, in them constantly. Um, but it's also important to note that in this room, many if you have had to sit in the back to try to plug in your computers, right? We have not put power plugs in here. And I'd like to say it was because we decided that we shouldn't have power plugs so that people wouldn't be distracted by the technology. Um, but I'm told, this is maybe an apocryphal story, um, but the designers of the building thought that there would be um, electrical power um, via wireless by the time the building came online and that that would be a more efficient way to do it than putting these in. I don't know if that in fact happens to be true uh, or not, but. Um, uh, in any event, that's why if you need power, you have to go back to the back. Um, but I think that this notion of intentionality is really important in the design of our teaching institution. Sometimes for education spaces, um, we sort of go too far ahead with the technology um, and then don't know what to do with it. On the other hand, sometimes we don't do enough imagining that the future is there. And it seems to me for OER, we're at a moment where a lot of it is actually happening, but we need to have the vision um, for where these um, many interventions actually come together. And I think it's wonderful that we have this moment to discuss um, both the key success factors necessary and the key interventions that we're most excited about. So hopefully that's given you enough time to look at what's up on the screen um, and think of your own things. There are Berkman runners with microphones, I hope. Um, and I can be a Berkman runner with a microphone. Um, but who would like to add either to the key factors for success or the specific interventions that we're most excited about from these various perspectives? This is the hardest segment right after lunch when everybody settles in, but I'm sure there are great thoughts brewing in this room. Or you can critique ones that are already up here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We'll let you do more reading. Well, maybe I'll ask while you think about specific interventions, a question that Carolina Rossini's and others' comments brought up for me as I was listening, um, we broke it down into the perspective of the learner, the uh, facilitators, quasi-teachers, and other intermediaries, and builders. And if you listen to each one, somebody forcefully said, the most important thing is for us to get into the perspective of the learner and, and work from there. And somebody else said, the most important thing is to make this easy for teachers and have teachers as partners. And somebody else said, the most important thing is for us, in fact, to make it easy to do building in chunks, right? We've had a lot of most important things. And the answer may, of course, be we have to do all of them. But also, maybe there's a force ranking. Does anybody want to weigh in on what the most important thing is? Or must we have a multi-front effort? Yes, thank you. Sally, this is a group effort, or a cluster effort. It must have come out of the cluster F success. It, Good. it did, but you missed it. I see, yes. I was meeting with a student, actually. Uh, yeah, I was doing my day job. This is a home <laughs> game for me, so it's difficult. I have to sneak out and do other things. Yeah. I'm not sure this is on, no. yep. but it is now. Um, I believe. Yes, indeed. Um, one of the things that you missed in our discussion of our cluster was the whole notion that um, if, if we focus on too many things, we can get lost in what we're doing. And there are finite resources to develop materials and to develop learning resources. And it's good to move them in similar directions. All of those things that were mentioned are important, but they build on one thing, I would suggest, and that is the student and learning. And if we start with that as a premise and say, things need to be built to help students learn and to acknowledge that no group of students learn in all the same way, it's important that we have resources that are available to let students have um, access to learning materials and resources from very different perspectives. They come with a different learning style, they come with different a priori knowledge, 
they approach whatever they're doing with a great deal of diversity across the whole concept of, of who are the learners. Yes, it's important that teachers have things that they can help students have access to to allow those students to learn what they need to learn. And yes, it's critically important that uh, the teachers and or whoever the hierarchy is in the framework be able to organize the student's learning and assist the student through the learning. But the learning materials themselves need to be geared to students. And we need to take a perspective of what's going to help students learn to, to move this forward. Thank you, Sally. Hold on to the mic for a second. I'm going to nudge you one bit more since you've stepped up to the mic. Um, wonderful prioritization. Students come first. This is where we should start. Just so we kind of get the language of um, uh, that you're thinking about in terms of what the science of learning is. Are you adopting the Howard Gardner style multiple intelligences framework? Since we're at Harvard, we may as well invoke one of our own from 30 years ago and uh, up to now. Um, or do you have something else in mind when you think about students and multiple learning styles? Should we, can we use Gardner's multiple intelligence as a keyword or would you adjust it in some fashion? I don't think we can use Gardner's uh -huh. because we're no longer dealing with um, an individual that we say moves into these different realms of approaches to learning or multiple intelligences. We're also dealing with such diversity in knowledge base for learners. So I'm, I'm at a university right now that our faculty do not teach. Our faculty coach and guide so that our students have to have access to good online, high quality learning materials. We don't create them. We license them, we find them, we pull them together from all kinds of resources. Some of the students that are working in the same program of study are going to come into that program of study with highly developed um, literacy skills either in computation or in language or whatever, and others are going to be at a different level, but they're still working in the same realm. So that's an example of how I don't think Gardner's work really would reflect what we need. And some students will have to work at different paces, not have to, but choose to work at very different paces. If the materials aren't designed to allow that to happen, and they're keyed to only a classroom environment, back to the teacher being, quote, the most important, we lose the effect of being able to accommodate to the widest variety of students. And, you know, the, the Gartner approach is one. That's fine. I mean, I studied that as an undergraduate. It was great. However, we have so many more variables that are coming into play when we try to describe who the learners are. Got it. Thank you. Will anyone agree or disagree even better with Sally's opening premise? Back here, please. I just want to add one note to that. We were talking about um, making it possible for diverse learners to reach the same goal, but I think the other thing we keep forgetting is the type of economy that we're in. We actually don't need to anymore produce learners that are clones or that um, meet the same particular standard. We actually need diverse learners. We need learners to learn different things, to um, develop different skills. And that's that, um, in the knowledge economy where we're the, the ultimate goal of education should be different as well. Great. And would you mind telling us um, your name and where you're from, just as a norm, unless you're not willing to be on the record? But it feels oh, like no, it no. may be helpful <laughs> for everybody to get to know. Um, one it's Jutta Tobranos, and I'm the dr uh, director of the Inclusive Design Research Center and Flow Project. Wonderful. Thank you. Other comments? Set. Yes. Sir. So along those lines, uh, and with like with most hard problems, I think. The biggest challenge is the last mile. Oh, I'm Andrew Maliazzi from finalsclub.org. Uh, the last mile problem. Um, so the end goal is not necessarily only getting resources out onto the internet, but into students' brains. And I think that requires more than anything the students' motivation. I think when, when we talk today about teachers in the flipped classroom as being coaches and motivators, I think that's probably the most valuable intervention we can enable. Um, to encourage students to want to learn. Mm -hmm. I think when, and then when they're ready, to have it really at their fingertips. I think that's why Khan Academy has been such a success, because it's really just a Google search away at the moment <laughs> when you're cramming for your exam the night before. 
uh, mm -hmm. when nothing else is at your fingertips. So Andrew, I'm, I'm with you that that would be a good thing and that certainly belongs as a key factor, but can you just do the obvious or maybe not so obvious linking between that and OER? Because they don't necessarily, that you could have coaches and mentors and use entirely Pearson produced materials that are not at all OER, right? Or pick, pick your uh, you know, commercial publisher, right? So they're, they're not necessarily linked concepts unless you do a little bit more kind of logical work here. Well, that's, that's true, um, and you can not read a free textbook just like in, you can not read a, <laughs> a textbook for $200, I suppose. Yes. Um, so it doesn't matter necessarily where the content comes from. In terms of OER, I think the, the key is having it be most accessible because that paywall uh, when you most need it is important. Uh, if you can just get access to it immediately, that, that does uh, lower barriers to learning, I think. Um, but also just in terms of being something that is equally accessible to everyone uh, who's involved in a student's academic life, whether it be the teacher, <coughs> uh, a parent, or a tutor at home. You don't have to worry about having the same textbook because it's always freely available wherever you are. So am I restating it incorrectly or correctly when I say the most important thing about OER is its broad accessibility to lots of people in the learner's life? I think so. Okay. I, think I would say that. Very helpful. We're getting someplace. These are prioritization statements. Carolina wants it back. So talking about most important things, right? Uh, one of the things we were discussing in our group, uh, it's about, uh, sorry, uh, localization, right? And what does that mean? And I think that opens in many subi most important things that is about open technologies, open licensing, involving community and uh, has individuals and volunteers. So this is one of the things on how you enable uh, people to localize, right? It's not how to localize OER, but how you enable a broader community to use and localize those resources and what are the implications for technology law and et cetera. So and can you policies, just right? may, maybe take a, a discrete example and build that out a little bit? So what is the, let's use the R, we've tended to focus on the O and the E, but what's the R you're thinking of that needs localization? Is it a, are you thinking about a file in the sense of a Wikipedia entry or, um, you know, a Khan Academy video or, you know, any number of other things that might qualify as an R that then needs to be localized? Or are you thinking about that in different terms? Yeah, no, uh, we are thinking about how, uh, the translation of softwares and platforms, like uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, building uh, OER within curriculum. So when we take technology to developing countries, OER is already part of the, the, the training of the teachers, right? Or uh, we are thinking about taking this topic to multinational forums. So when OER arrives in the country, that doesn't clash with the local policy. So there are various examples that are more concrete, right, uh, that, that comes from it. And, and how we think when we are designing our OER projects that, that uh, how we're going to design our projects in a way that this development is, ina is enabled. So. And can you give a couple examples of what localization means? Is it linguistic localization? Is it for an individual that learner or different class? That was one of the class? discussions of our, our group. And we, I think we mainly think about language but also language means culture, so that was actually, uh, Wayne used that phrasing, if I'm not uh, incorrect. Uh, uh, so starting with language and then uh, letting people uh, do the second step, which is the culture, right? And would the localizers be the facilitators in our language, or the makers, or the learners, or so all of the above, potentially? So in terms of uh, individuals, we were looking both into collaborations between the users and also the intermediaries. So okay. if you think about that macro, micro categories, there are two that needed to, to, to talk. Got it. And what's your cluster, Carolina? I'm sorry? Which was your cluster that had this good conversation? A. Cluster A? All right. Cluster A gets an A. That's cool. That's a good one. Excellent. I love how the clusters are coming in, even in the top-down session. That's good. Awesome. Who else? I did not expect silence from this august group, I have to say. Matthew Battles, tell us who you are. I'm Matthew Battles uh, with MetaLab uh, Berkman Project. Um, if, I feel like I, I'd like to see some intervention around outreach and raising consciousness um, beyond the classroom uh, in communities at large, um, in, in the cultural discourse, as it were. I mean, I think we have some, you know, some kind of wedge points in terms of the, the uh, you know, the breaking down of cultural barriers to the use of Wikipedia in, in many contexts. Um, 
the work that uh, Creative Commons has done to slowly infiltrate um, the world of, of uh, you know, cultural makers and, and artists and creators. Um, I think there's more of that work that could be done for open education resources, um, ways to intervene in the, in the dialogue so that what learners expect, all of us being learners ultimately, uh, what students expect, what parents expect their, their children to experience in the classroom is, is open. Um, so what does that kind of outreach look like? How does that conversation um, get fostered in the community at large? Matthew, we're here at the Harvard Law School, and one of the things that we drill students in is thinking analogically. Are there analogies that might help? Can you think of any analogic movements or uh, experiences you might know of about getting the word out in this fashion that we might uh, model the OER experience after? Well, you know, I think, again, of, of, of Wikipedia and, and Creative Commons as, as um, resources that have, have built an identity um, in society at large. Um, you know, on the, uh, sort of on the other end of some spectrum, I'm not sure what it is, I think of um, uh, long-term projects like Theater of the Oppressed, um, you know, uh, community uh, developed uh, 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 engagement and, and uh, a kind of rubric for a kind of experience that happens among people in community organizations. I'll give you one example. I've got a friend in, in Toronto um, who developed a project called Upper Toronto. And this was a kind of crazy um, theatrical slash community development intervention in which uh, he and his collaborators um, started a series of community meetings, like community, like neighborhood development meetings, um, organized around the idea that that they were going to build a Toronto on top of the Toronto that exists today, a kind of Toronto in the sky. And under this kind of science fictional notion, they got groups at neighborhood levels um, to start thinking about what their ideal neighborhood is, what their ideal city is. What, what, you know, in what ways their experience of Toronto falls short from their model of what they'd like to see. And so, you know, in a kind of fun and playful way, they moved towards, um, uh, towards a, a kind of set of, you know, begun, begun to specify a set of interventions that they could make in policy, in political, uh, in, in the political dynamics uh, uh, of the city. So, you know, maybe there are ways in which you can think about um, anything from like a pop-up classroom, uh, you know, the way uh, uh, groups around uh, North America have had these pop-up parks in parking spaces, you know. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a media campaign uh, uh, with viral video. Maybe it's a way of using Khan Academy videos in kind of remixing them in, in, in interesting ways that get to other media other than the web. Um, I don't know, those are some, some kind of uh, spectrum of analogies that come to mind. Super helpful. And it turns out that in one of the nice serendipitous events, we have many people from Creative Commons here who might be able to amplify this. And Cable Green is, in fact, the director of global learning who could answer that. But um, if things get slow uh, again, Matthew, I'm coming back to you. Matthew has written two, at least, of the most interesting books on libraries that I know of. Um, and we haven't actually talked that much about libraries. They might be a good piece to fill in in this puzzle. As a library director myself, I'm quite conscious of the extent to which there is commonality of effort, and increasingly so as we digitize our collection. So I may, may be coming back to you if you're willing. Very well, Cable. thanks, John. So I like, I like your question a lot about uh, how, how do we get parents and students to expect that open is the default in their learning environments, and when it's not there, that there's, some, that there's something wrong with that. And I think there's a lot of strategies that you could use. One of them that I'm most interested in is commonly referred to as open policy. So open policy, in a nutshell, says if you are taking public funds and you're using those public funds to build something, that it's fine to keep the copyright whoever builds it, but uh, you must put an open license on what you build. Why? Well, because it was paid for by the public. The public should have free and open access to what they paid for. If we move to open policies, and move broadly to open policies. And what I mean by that is countries around the world uh, adopt open policies where they say, if you take this federal or national government money, uh, you will share what you build. Um, if there are institutional policies that say, if you are a faculty and you're paid with public funds, you will share what you build. Um, if uh, states, countries that recognize that they have common educational resource needs, um, for example, to use the United States as an example uh, today, 
Uh, there are 46 states that have adopted the Common Core standards. In fact, those 46 states have common need around textbooks and curriculum that's updated to meet those new standards. Um, it's, it's appropriate, I would argue, for the government to see that as a, a national uh, priority and a common need. And in fact, as public funds are already used uh, in public education, uh, in this case, elementary education, that, and they're currently being used in a highly inefficient manner, uh, public policymakers, once educated about public policy, uh, should very quickly move toward it. And then the default, the, the net result of that is really two things of open policy. One is that the public money, which is where most of the money is, I mean, as grateful as we all are to the Pulitt Foundation and other foundations for helping to fund OER movements, uh, most of the money is not in foundations. Most of the money is in the public sphere. So the one, one outcome is that you move the bulk of the public funds that, that go to education and go to research to open. And, and the, the, to be very specific about that, if you want this money, you will share what you build. If you're not willing to share what you build, you may not have this public money. That's what open policy gets at. So, so the one outcome is that sustainability around open really ceases to become an issue because the public funds have shifted. Open is now the default and closed and proprietary becomes the exception. And if you, if you want to use public funds and you want an exception, you want to close it, you're going to have to make quite a good case before the public will allow you to do so. So that's one outcome you get. And the second outcome, which I really think goes to your question, is that you, with public policies, you really change the air. You change the environment of the learning, of the learning space because if the default policy is that all public funds are openly licensed materials or research or whatever is being produced, then the public now has an expectation that they'll have access, right? So if I, if I go into a classroom uh, as a student, as a taxpayer, I have an expectation that my, my textbooks, my course materials, the research, the data that's generated by my government, et cetera, that as a, as a public, tax-paying citizen, I'll have access, not just free access, but also legal access to all that information. Then I think we change the expectations. And I know that Sir John Daniel and Stemake are here uh, from Commonwealth of Learning. They'll talk about some very exciting work that's happening uh, now and this year, in fact, around this very topic. Okay, well, hang on to the mic for one second. I just want to um, have you look at what we've put on the screen, because I'm not positive it um, reflects what you meant. So where it says adopt open policy in OER movements, is it, in fact, adopt open policy at the school level? What's the level at which, who should be adopting open policies? Yes, in, in your ideal world, a year from now, if X people said open policy is the way to go, who would that be? Yeah, so, so open policy, the, the one sentence on it is uh, publicly funded resources are openly licensed resources. Now, you could also say publicly funded resources go into the public domain. That's, that's okay, too. But to the extent that some people want to keep copyright, publicly funded resources are openly licensed resources. So it's not just about OER, right? It's about anything that's built with public funds should be openly licensed and freely available. So this obviously links us to the open access movement and others that have taken similar policies. Exactly. Who, who's the decision maker? Who are the series of decision makers that we're level? speaking to? Yeah, so uh, I, th I think ideally uh, those of us who are interested in open policy, we're shooting at multiple levels. Certainly uh, gov governments. So you're looking for national policies where the, where the country is saying when public funds are used uh, of, of public, mon public monies at the national level, that those, uh, those resources will be openly licensed. You're looking at states and provinces to adopt similar policies. You're looking for educational systems to adopt certain policies. So uh, my last job, I worked for the Washington Community and Technical Colleges, and they adopted a system-wide policy that said, if you take money from the system, you will put a CC BY license on everything you build. If you don't like those terms, don't take money from the system. Right? And then you, can, then you go down to institutional policies, also very effective. You can get a single institution to adopt a similar policy. Um, and, and the nice thing about these open policies is as precedents begin popping up, we can point at others. And one country will point at another country and say, well, the Netherlands are ahead of the United States. We need to catch up. How do we catch up to that? New Zealand is ahead. Australia is ahead. 
Poland just moved ahead with open textbooks. Brazil has been leading for a long time. And so there gets to be some competition, right? We Got don't it. want to be behind. So it's national, state, and system-wide policymakers who are the target, in a way, of this, at least the next stage in policymaking. And I'd go as granular as institutions. I wouldn't go much lower than that. Got it. Very helpful. Um, Andrew, I'll come back to you if there's not another hand. I just want to do one per customer until then. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Eric Frank with Flat World Knowledge. I mean, I think part of our struggle when I think about um, when raising the discourse is it strikes me that, that to a large degree we really struggle to put forth exemplars that, that can really capture people's imaginations, right? Why is this important? You know, I, I subscribe to the sort of Clay Christensen view of the world that, say, that says people hire products and services to help them do a job they have in their life and, and they want that job to be done more efficiently um, uh, more cheaply and they want it to be done easily and so they go out and look for a product or service to help them do that and I think what we struggle with to, to a degree is why who cares why should it matter what is it that we can say what is it we can hold up um, that people can grasp onto that's why I, I look at something like textbooks and you sort of say that that does capture people's imagination a little bit because they understand it they understand they pay $180 and I could pay anywhere between zero and $30 um, and and that that's concrete and, and it and helps people do a job they're already doing um, more cheaply and more efficiently so I think that part of the challenge is you know sort of what is it that that, that people publicly can rally around and say this is a really important movement um, uh, I mean I think cable you, you know your point um, is right but it doesn't mean people get emotionally um, uh, behind it. And so what is it that, that we can hold up that people can get emotionally behind? You know, when Excelsior University builds a sub $10,000 bachelor's degree because they were able to build it on the building blocks of open resources, that becomes more meaningful in people's imaginations. Wow, uh, you're saying a degree can become less than $10,000 because of the existence of these open resources. I get that. But we, 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 we don't have a lot of those. So I. I the intervention, I guess, there specifically is um, uh, we need more, I think, really specific uh, examples and beachheads that people can grab onto and say, I see the end benefit of this, and therefore, I can get behind the policies that would scale this greater uh, and faster. Great. Can you hang on to the mic for a second? You invoked Clayton Christensen, another member of the faculty here, um, and I wanted to push you a little bit on his view of this to see how far you'll go. Have you read his book on universities? Yes. I suspect for, uh, being at Flat World Knowledge, you would. Um, do you subscribe to the full extent of his theory about what the future holds for universities? Which, if you have read it, it's pretty bleak, right? We maybe the very high end universities will persist, but the vast majority of universities that either um, don't have a brand to rest on at the very, very high level or who do something really radical and amazing in terms of reorienting themselves are going to go out of business, right? Yeah. So do you go yeah. that far? I, you know, yeah, I think I probably do. Um, I, I don't know what the time frame of that is, uh, but uh, we were talking in our subgroup. I mean, I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, Maslow's hierarchy is, is sort of real, right? And, and I think one of the things that people are in pursuit of is security. And, and a big part of that security is economic self-security. And I think people will pursue the avenues that they see as the, the most direct lines to that economic self-security. And so as uh, I thought Kevin Carey wrote a, a wonderful piece today in, in the Chronicle about badges uh, at, at UC Davis, and you know, we're all talking about um, skills like systems thinking and problem solving being critical. And what UC Davis is saying is I, I can give you a degree but along with that degree, I can give you some real badges uh, that, that, that indicate that you are an excellent systems thinker. And, and, and that's blending the best of, of sort of a traditional educational approach with the best of, of sort of a new approach to education. I think that is an enlightened view, and that could make UC Davis's program uh, in agricultural systems very relevant into the future. Uh, I think that competing with programs that don't, are, are, that's going to win. The marketplace will value that approach. Um, and and I, I actually think one of the great benefits of, of OER, but it's hard to, to put your finger right on it, is that in our own way, in a very disconnected, uh, 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 incidental sort of way, we are creating a lot of the building blocks that are allowing 
disruptors in education to come along and say, hey, there's starting to be enough stuff that I can stitch together affordably and start to deliver an alternative product to the traditional institutions and provide a more direct pathway for people looking for economic self-security. That's a huge macroeconomic driver. Uh, I think it, that trends are going to just continue. I think that disruption will become increasingly uh, exponential, and I do think that he's probably right in the long run that, that that's going to happen. Great. So one more beat, and we'll go to Erhard. Um, one of the difficulties, I think, that we face those who believe in OER is to articulate this vision that you're talking about and have some exemplars, as you noted. One of the difficulties I have with Clay Christensen's argument, and was on a panel with him recently on this topic, is the extent to which I think there's a version of this that really just stands in for online education and actually says it's not about residential experiences. It's not about the kinds of magic that one can put together in a campus. And we can sort of forget about all this physical infrastructure and these face-to-face -face experiences. I don't think he's talking about the flipped classroom. I actually mm -hmm. think he's saying the flipped classroom, too, might be completely out the window, mm -hmm. right? I think he's going way further than that. Are you also saying we do we can repurpose the you know great land-grant universities and the you know the, these wonderful spaces that we have created for education? and just rely on your materials? <laughs> it, it, it is I, I, the logical extension of the argument, and, it's, and yeah. I, I wonder how far we actually go. And yeah, like, no, do I don't think that. I mean, I think, I, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, it, it feels like one, so I remember, you know, I, I, I'm a supplier, right? So I always take a supplier a yeah. and a content view yes. of the world, right? And I went to see, um, uh, John Bourne, uh, one of the founders at, at um, uh, the Olin School of Engineering. And I said, John, what do you think about this idea about flat world knowledge? He said, I think it's fine. I think it's good. You'll take the cost of textbooks down. You'll transform the textbook from this static object to this dynamic platform, and people can incrementally improve it. And it's all right. good. That's really happy, right. happy stuff. But I don't think, does anybody disagree up to that point? <laughs> but I think most people, in a sense, would think you know, more dynamism in the teaching materials is a good right. thing. Right, all good. And, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with it. But he said that's not really how people learn. It doesn't, you know, people learn when you, uh, you have a really interesting and hard challenge. You, you put them together in a team and say, go solve that challenge. And, and then you provide them with some coaching along the way, and, and then the materials and the supplies come in in support of the pursuit of that challenge, right? I need information, I'm stuck, I gotta read something, I gotta go get a video, I gotta watch something. And the more uh, that's available to me at that just-in-time moment, the more helpful it is, and I can solve the problem and move ahead, and I've actually learned something. So I think, you know, um, and we don't do that really well in a lot of places, and we do it really well in other places. So I think learning has to happen. Um, and it's not going to happen by just sort of, you know, being plopped down and saying, here's, here's resources. Um, so I think learning environments need to be there. I think those learning environments are going to change dramatically. Right. Uh, that's, I, I don't know if I answered your question. But. Sort of you did, but you also <laughs> dodged it. I, I'm pretty uh, good at evasiveness. So it's, uh, Erhard. Uh, just come on, there we go. Um, hi, I'm Erhard Grafe. I'm a, uh, I'm a mentor at the Berkman Youth and Media Lab. I work with uh, Andrew on Finals Club, and I've been researching this space for a few years. Um, Maybe just go a little closer to the mic because it's being sure, recorded. Sure, sure, I can put it up. Um, I want to move a little bit away from economics and talk about culture, um, connected back to a few things that have been said during this course, and in, in particular, SJ's point uh, yesterday at the very end of the introductory session where he said that maybe we need to stop thinking about what we buy and sell and need to be thinking about uh, educational materials as the building blocks of our culture and society. Um, and really, maybe there needs to be a shift in the culture in the way that we think about educational materials. And so I wonder if there's a, an intervention point that can happen at the teacher training level, right? At teacher colleges, at, at, uh, at programs like Teach for America, where we actually change the value or the values that these new teachers have when it comes to educational materials. And so they're entering the classroom. They have an incentive to uh, move toward open learning uh, tools and objects, right? Because they have to create curriculum from scratch for the classrooms that they're going to enter. And so they could have some building blocks to start from. That would give them the incentive then to contribute um, down the road when they're creating their own curriculum. And I wonder if that's something we could instill as a value at, at, at that level. You know, and I, uh, one thing that I think about is the free culture movement, which for so long was uh, nested in colleges, you know, with free culture um, clubs, you know, kind of putting these ideas out there and, and encouraging students to change their value system around what it meant 
to be buying and selling culture. And uh, I think Alex Kovac, who's here, could do a better job of describing that model. But I wonder if that is a good intervention for you. So can you, Eric, take a look at what we've got up here? Is there something more specific that you had in mind rather than sort of broad uh, cultural change? Is it, um, do you want some specific teacher training? Or are you thinking about just we should all devote ourselves to this kind of reform of how teachers think about their jobs? Well, I, I mean, quite honestly, I think it needs to be grassroots. Uh -huh. You know, um, I, I don't think we can astroturf value change. Um, I think, you know, it sometimes happens in politics, but, you know, I really think that we need somebody, uh, we need a teacher to come into the classroom and say, I'm committed to, to using these type of materials and contributing to that from the get-go. Yes. Um, and then from there on, give them tools that can support that. Um, but it has to start from them. I think that's a great soundbite. We cannot astroturf value change. I suspect all of us would agree, but can I push you the same way I pushed Please. Matthew? What, is there any analogy to the kinds of programs that have changed cultures as substantial as the teaching culture in the United States or teaching culture in the world? That's a tall order. And that we're is looking at intervention order. points, right? <laughs> so even the Hewlett Foundation with its next $100 million would have a hard time, I think, just plunking it down on something to do that. Well, there's a, there's a cognate movement, I would say, which is the open access scholarship movement. Okay. Um, and in that, I'd say we have uh, a, a cohort of graduate students that are coming through and seeing that as a value that they want to persist mm -hmm. as they become professors and publish in open access journals. Um, and so I don't see why we can't have that at the higher education level as well as the K through 12 level, mm -hmm. um, saying that both of these areas are pushing toward open as the model for, for publication and sharing. Is Peter Suber still here? Yes, Peter, would you mind um, reflecting on whether this is an apt analogy or an inapt one, and then Sally gets the microphone after you? Then I don't see a good analogy. We've been trying to change values in the open access movement for more than a decade. We've started to succeed, but that's because when you light enough fires, they start to join together. Uh, I wish we had a strategy 10 years ago to change values systematically. Uh, I don't think you can do it top down. You do it bottom up. It was called Fund Peter Suber to be Fund the Peter chief, Suber. That, chief fire lighter. That'll do it. It won't work this time around, but it worked the last time. But you're right. We have to do it that way. We have to change minds. We have to change minds separately. Uh, we have to fund people who will organize people who will change minds. We have to write persuasively so that we succeed in changing minds when people uh, pay attention. But I don't think there is a systematic strategy for doing that. I wish there was. Can I ask you to think about other analogies? Do you think, is, uh, so we may or may not think the open access movement is a good analogy for the kind of culture change that Earhart wants. Are there other ones that you would bring into play? Uh, I can't think of a better one right now, but I want to build on what he said. We are now seeing uh, graduate students and publishing scholars uh, internalizing the values that drive the open access movement. There were always some of that in the movement, but the movement was largely driven by uh, gadflies like me or by librarians and by administrators. Uh, we needed uptake from the people whose decisions would make a difference. Those were the publishing scholars. We're finally getting that, but we got it after 10 years of changing the environment. I think we'll get the same sort of change in OER when we get uptake from the people whose decisions will make a difference. Uh, those will be the people who build, the people who teach, the people who learn. And that's what we're all working on together. But it's another way of saying I don't see a direct path there, just a lot of indirect paths. Great. Sally, has your point been made? Or would you like to amplify? No, you'd like more? Yes. Uh, and, and then you after. I, I wanted to uh, sort of echo the notion that a change in this realm has to start uh, very early. So the trick, however, is pre-service teacher education and intervening, having tried to do this in multiple times in the last five years, intervening in that is a tough, tough issue because the people who are the faculty in our colleges of education across the country have no clue how to do this. So trying to think in terms of interventions that are um, appropriate at perhaps professional association levels for faculty who teach pre-service teachers could be a very critical intervention point. It will take a long time, but all of our faculty in teacher ed colleges across the country are not all gonna retire in the next two years. 
They're going to be around for a long time and helping them to understand how you flip a classroom or how this can happen or the how that can happen is really critical. And most of the efforts right now in interventions in that area is just trying to help pre-service teachers understand how to use data, you know, how to comprehend analytics so that they can understand how to predict what their students are doing. Right. It's, it's a tough model. Aim for the ed schools. That goes up there too. Um, Quasi, and then can you hand it to the cool cat teacher over there with the blue uh, scarf? Great, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm Quasi, sorry, and I'll use the same disclaimer as Eric. I'm on the supply side as well. Uh, just to address your, your thoughts around an analog for uh, how could we actually make this work. Uh, it seems to me that it's you know, fairly easy to export product, uh, and a lot of us fall prey and victim to that fairly easy. It's far more difficult to export practice. Um, and when the NBA wanted to get their sport more prominently adopted and considered around the world, they didn't just ship out NBA Spalding basketballs. They actually went out there, they had clinics, they're involved with the hearts and the minds of the folks out there, and they showed them uh, reference models and approaches for actually you actually do this. Uh, so for us, I think as we, as we think about actually having this you know, take ground and, and get traction and be more, uh, more effectively, sustainably adopted across uh, the globe, amongst multiple stakeholders, we need to think about how do we also bring along the practices that go along with the product that are actually being delivered and consumed on the other side. It's nicely put. Seems surely right. Uh, what, Quasi, did I say your name correctly? Quasi. Quasi, Quasi sorry. And would you um, mind, just since if someone might be watching this as a separate segment, okay. I know we're, you're all well known to us who have been here uh, today. Vicki Davis, uh, Flat Classroom Projects and Cool Cat Teacher Blog. Um, what you said about clinics is exactly right, and I'm going to give a, a hat tip here to the clandestine cluster K that we're in. We've named ourselves. But if you want to look, you've been asking, what are some examples of grassroots change? And I saw many speak from K-12. And there are three I can think of. Number one, the Webheads. When they created that program at EdTech Talk about four years ago, that preceded um, the uh, explosion of podcasting in education. You've got the Google Teacher Academy. Um, that's three or four years ago that it started, and now you see it two or three years later. And you've got the 23 Things, which is a very viral, open training program for librarians that just about every savvy librarian I know has been through that program, and it's very open. And so our group has actually been talking about creating the OER Challenge for 2013, where there need to be, and, and to sell it as the opportunity to explore and align so that you don't leave opportunity on the table as you're aligning with Common Core standards. And give them a way to go through 52 weeks out of the year, you know, a different um, opportunity every year, but to also ask OER resources to make it so that we can tag everything with a standard. So whether we're in the UK or the US, it doesn't matter, that we could actually tag your resources with a standard and find other users that are using those resources. So, you know, I think there should be a formal program, and since you're open, it's going to have to be an open program, but actually have an injection point to, to get everybody on your platform and using it this week, and then using it next week. But those are, if you want to look at best practices, those are the three that I would suggest you look at, because they have had major change in K-12. Vicki, thank you. And what's your cluster, so we can credit your group for those uh, ideas? The clandestine. Well? Cluster case. I love it. The clandestine cluster case. All right, we've got uh, just a moment or two before we switch over to Justin Reichen. I don't know, Justin, if you want to um, come on up and start setting up as we do so there's good um, uh, transition time. Uh, but I wanted to see, if, is anyone um, from our host at the Hewlett Foundation want to have a last word on this segment, noting that we've um, made a bunch of suggestions as a community of uh, yes. both key factors and key interventions. I don't know if uh, a privileging of uh, a host comment might make sense at this point. That was a general cold call on our friends, but. Yeah, that would be great. Um, Caroline here has the mic. Coming to you, sorry. Hi. Um so I'll just say thank you all for your for your great ideas. I mean, um, I think overall uh, change needs to come from everyone in the community, right? Um, and so I can't say anything about like what's fundable or not fundable or those kinds of things. If you're looking for that kind of no, uh, no, this was more feedback, a reflection. Or is this in the right general direction? <laughs> that sort of thing. But. 
Um, but I think these are all uh, great intervention points for us to keep in mind as we continue to talk through our clusters, as we think through the heat map, as we're thinking about where, do these, where could these possibly fit in the ecosystem as far as being sustainable. Um, I like the idea of probably taking a few of these maybe to the hack day and seeing if there are some things that could come out of the, the hack day also. Great. So for my part, the thing that I heard very clearly was we trended in the early segments uh, to be focusing on relatively kind of point interventions. And in this uh, broader group, it seemed like there was a hungering to take a very successful but relatively early stage movement and make it a much bigger one and one that is mainstreamed. I don't think that's a surprise, but it just seemed like that's where we all uh, inclined. That seems like uh, a good sign that everybody's thinking about scaling up in productive ways. And I want to thank you for um, active participation in this uh, first of the synthesis session. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.